Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have the distinct pleasure of having a repeat performance back by popular demand, so to speak, of uh, uh, Raghada Dirham and uh, General David Petraeus. Very few um, uh, officers of flag rank, those of uh, uh, Brigadier General and above, or Vice Admiral and above, uh, make it uh, to uh, four stars. Uh, General David Petraeus is one of those, one of the few, okay? Their numbers are tinier than minuscule. Uh, their stature uh, more midgetary and dwarfish than tall. With regard to his academic achievements, very few achieve their doctorate. And how in the hell, in the course of an armed services career of more than 30 some years, are you going to find time to do your uh, dissertation work, your examinations, your qualifying uh, uh, degrees, and write a dissertation? That number is even tinier and fewer uh, than the number of four star uh, armed services officers. Uh, and we're lucky to have him. He's, he's a member of our advisory committee and has been so now for a uh, half a decade, and each um, of our annual Arab-U.S. policymakers conferences, he's, he's agreed to speak from wherever he might be. And likewise, to interview him and grill him, they could almost be interchangeable parts, like Eli Whitney's interchangeable parts there. Um, she uh, will uh, interview him, grill him, drill him, and he will uh, speak rapidly on his feet, neither one from, from notes per se. Raghad Adirham is an award-winning uh, correspondent, journalist, media a specialist and was the dean of the, Amer of the, of the United Nations uh, media uh, correspondents for years. She's the co-founder along with uh, His Royal Highness Prince Turkey of the Beirut Institute, which uh, holds year-round a series of seminars that uh, I regard them as cerebral massages uh, there, where she brings in people from east, west, north, south to address the cutting issues of, of the day with no holes barred and complete freedom of, of expression. Uh, please welcome remotely through this great technology, uh, Raghad Adiram and General David Petraeus. Thank you very much. Thank you, John Dick Anthony. Thank you for having us again. It's an honor and a privilege to have this yearly event with uh, General Petraeus, a dear friend and one of our great thinkers in the United States and the world, actually, of my view. And uh, General, thank you for joining us again for this conversation. This is a 45 minutes conversation that uh, would have to go uh, from one extreme of the world to another. Uh, you are used to me being uh, a bit quick on my feet in this one. So please tolerate me uh, for, and it's not an interruption on purpose. I just want to make sure that we cover as much as possible. But I want to stay, uh, I want to start rather with the fact that you have been the chairman of the Global Institute at KKR for 10 years. And give us, from your point of view, the sort of the geopolitical picture, how did it evolve, given that the Ukraine war is set to have change the world uh, order and we're going to a new one. Welcome, Gerard Petraeus, to you. Well, thanks very much, Roger. Always great to be with you. And uh, thanks, doc Dr. John Duke Anthony, for the invitation to do this yet again this year. Uh, I, during the course of the nearly 10 years, it's actually over nine and a half now that I've been the chairman of the KKR Global Institute, uh, the world has evolved enormously. Uh, most significantly because of the continued and further rise of China uh, and its actions on the world stage, certainly also uh, with the resurgence of Russian activity as well, most significantly, of course, recently, the unprovoked invasion of Ukraine. But I think the way to characterize what has transpired is to note that, again, a decade or so ago, the world was generally in a, it described as benign globalization. That would be how we would characterize geopolitics at that time, in a world in which economics largely drove geopolitics. All we cared about really was the most uh, inexpensive labor, the cheapest materials, manufacturing, assembly, transportation, and so forth. Uh, supply chains were solid. You could actually have just-in-time logistics, uh, as the term was used. Uh, but in the course of that decade, uh, which again most significantly featured the, the enormous rise, continued rise of China, uh, and also, then, of course, now 
uh, over two and a half years of pandemic that have disrupted supply chains and uh, a variety of other issues around the world, we are now in a world that is described as one of renewed great power rivalries. Uh, and in this world, geopolitics now increasingly drives economics. It constrains it. It creates the context in which investment, trade, and other financial uh, and diplomatic activities take place. And that is a very, very profound trans transformation. Uh, now we care very much uh, about dual-use technologies. Now the entities lists are growing. Now there are export controls, for example, on the uh, transfer of high-end microchips and even their components uh, to China, as an example, from the United States just in the past week uh, or so. Enormous numbers of financial, economic, and personal sanctions, as well as export controls on Russia. Uh, and, and again, supply chains just can't be relied on. And so now it's just in case logistics instead of just in time uh, logistics. Uh, in addition to that, labor costs have gone up uh, in China. Uh, and again, there are additional concerns. And you see really very, very transformed uh, uh, supply chains, uh, investment patterns, trade, and so forth uh, in this world now of renewed great power rivalries, which is really the tagline, not just of this administration's national security strategy, but really was the one of the previous administrations as well. Hmm. So, General, let me just start with a very blunt question with you, and it's a phrase I'll borrow from you. Uh, tell me how it ends, that, that war in the Ukraine. Well, eventually, I think it ends with some kind of negotiated resolution. That's typically how wars do end. That's a reasonably uh, comfortable prediction to make. The problem is I can't tell you when that might be possible. Right now, the Venn diagrams, interests of President Putin on one side and President Zelensky on the other, have virtually no overlap. Uh, neither is inclined to negotiate right now. President Putin thinks that he can do what Russians have historically done, as they did when they outsuffered Napoleon's army, they outsuffered the Nazis, and they think they're going to outsuffer not just the Ukrainians, but the Europeans as well during what they think will be a very tough winter for the U Europeans. I don't share that, by the way, and I've been to Europe three times in the last five weeks. Uh, natural gas uh, fill is over 92% of the capacity that they have for storage. The winter started off as very mild. There are literally LNG carriers parked off the European mainland waiting for uh, the area in which they can store that. And the, the spot price of natural gas last week when I was in London actually was briefly negative. Now, it's not the future price, which is still very elevated. Uh, but to have that happen is very, very significant. So I, I'm not at all confident that Putin's uh, hope that he can again uh, be more determined that the Russians can outsuffer their uh, opponents and those supporting their opponents uh, will prove true. Um, Do you, you know that President Zelensky is absolutely determined to take advantage of a very stark reality for Russia, uh, which is that the Ukrainian army now is larger and more capable than that of Russia on Ukrainian soil. Mm -hmm. uh, Ukraine has totally mobilized brilliantly. It's recruiting, training, equipping, organizing, and employing has been extraordinary, especially compared with the shambolic partial mobilization uh, of Russia. Ukrainians have made significant gains on the battlefield over the last month and a half or so. They seem poised to do more of that uh, down in the south and to take back the area that is west of the Dnipro River. Uh, and so he is not going to negotiate. In fact, if anything, the Russian punishment in recent weeks uh, of Ukraine with missile and drone strikes on their energy infrastructure has hardened the resolve of the Ukrainian people, and they would not now negotiate. So many months of tough fighting, tough casualties, uh, and, a, and a hard winter, but it's going to be a winter that's much tougher for Russia than it is for Ukraine uh, before there's any inclination on either side. One last point, the casualties on Russia's side have been horrific. They have already lost at least, and it's probably much more than this, but at least four times in eight months, the soldiers that they lost in nine years in Afghanistan. And that is very, very substantial. That was a tough war for them. It was one that ultimately contributed to the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Uh, and at some point in time, uh, again, that reality is going to appear more and more significant uh, in Moscow as well. 
Yeah, so it seems that uh, ceasefire is unlikely from what I understand. Uh, many specialists are saying, I don't know if you agree with that. that oh, not no prospect of a ceasefire. You see no prospect for a ceasefire? None. No, no. Ukraine is going to fight on. Uh, Ukraine has the momentum. Yes, it's been slow recently. They had to catch up their logistics to the front lines. They made such uh, significant gains in the east uh, in Kharkiv province, now starting into Luhansk uh, province. Uh, and they literally had to move their Iron Mountain, all of their support, logistics, combat support, and so forth, up closer to the front lines. At some point, you'll see some further progress there. And as I mentioned, we're going to see, I think, in the course of the months that lie ahead, the winter months, they'll take back uh, everything that is west of the Dnipro River as well. Oh, so let's talk about the one word that is rather scary to a lot of people, and I'm not so sure how you are able uh, to dissect that, but apparently the nuclear choice or option, if you will. There's been increased concern, it seems to be, by the Biden this administration, as reported, uh, that the Russian military leaders actually discussed the use of nuclear weapons. Uh, and you have said that in such a case, the U.S. will destroy the Russian army. Can you tell me how do you see uh, the world reacting, the U.S. Re reacting, if there is a nuclear use by the Russians? And do you think the Russians, uh, Mr. Putin, will go for the nuclear uh, option, I think it's, or otherwise? I think it's quite unlikely that Russia will use any nuclear weapons, uh, including tactical nuclear weapons. And I think it's clear... I think to them now, as a result of statements by the U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, who said publicly that he had communicated privately that the results of that would hold catastrophic consequences for Russia. That indicates to me uh, that the range of options certainly would continue what I uh, identified as a possibility, just one of the options, which would be a U.S.-led uh, strike, uh, U.S. multinational force-led strike uh, that would result in Russia being in an even worse position on the battlefield in Ukraine than it was before the use of those nuclear you mean weapons. NATO. And what needs to be you conveyed to, to Putin very clearly is that he is in a very deep hole. And when you're in a deep hole, you need to stop digging. Use of tactical nuclear weapons would dig that hole even deeper, and he would be in a worse situation after it rather than a better situation. Uh, General, do you mean NATO-led U.S. Uh, forces? I mean, uh, do you think that we'll have boots on the ground? Uh, no, I don't think you'd see boots on the ground, and I don't necessarily think you would see a, quote, NATO-led operation. The wheels of NATO's politics, I don't know that they would move as rapidly as might be required in such a situation. That just remains to be seen. Again, among the options, you'll see everything in a menu that has undoubtedly already been refined quite a bit by the U.S. National Security Council staff, together, I would think, with some of our closest allies. That would include everything from diplomatic uh, steps, uh, additional financial, economic, and personal sanctions, more export controls, and a menu of military actions that could be taken um, that would be laid out for the president. The military would make a recommendation based on what the president identifies as the objectives uh, of such a response. But again, this is all very hypothetical. And without knowing the specific case, without knowing what it did, how it transpired, uh, it's impossible to say with any degree of precision. And we shouldn't actually overly speculate on that, frankly. What do you mean by uh, international or multinational forces? Where are they coming from? If it's not NATO or is it with NATO? Can you explain that a little further? When you well, I think, again, it would be U.S. and uh, closest allies. Uh, again, we've had, we have a history of other operations around the world over time. Uh, and again, it's typically the U.S. leading with other countries uh, engaged as well. I need to push you on this one. Why? I mean, a lot of people are afraid that Putin, Mr. Putin, will actually go for the nuclear option because if he is squeezed further, he's got no other option. What do you, what do you, what do you figure out? What do you? Uh, uh, I mean, why aren't you afraid? Why aren't you worried about it? Why do? You, why are you confident that he will not? I'm, I'm not confident that he will not. I said it is unlikely uh, that he would resort to use of nuclear weapons, and the reason for that assessment is my sense 
that the U.S. and other countries, again, our closest allies, uh, presumably, have conveyed to their counterparts in the Kremlin that such a course of action would result in Russia being worse off rather than better off as a result of taking that particular action. I'm and I think they've telling- conveyed that very clearly. They've Again, it's quite stark for uh, you know, Jake Sullivan. You know him well as well. Uh, he's it, He is an understated, a mild-mannered, brilliant uh, individual. Uh, and when he says the words catastrophic consequences, that is very, very significant. Uh, and and I think that, he, that that has been conveyed very, very clearly. Uh, and they understand that they'd be in a worse situation rather than a better situation if they were, in fact, to use uh, nuclear weapons. Keep in mind, by the way, that a tactical nuclear weapon, depending on the yield and, and, and so forth, how it's used and everything else, it has a tactical effect. It doesn't change this dynamic that I described earlier that is so stark for Russia that they do not have as good, as large, or as capable a military force on Ukrainian soil as do the Ukrainian armed forces. And there, I think there's really nothing that he can do about it. Russians. The partial mobilization uh, is not going to provide anything more than essentially cannon fodder. Now, cannon fodder in urban settings can be problematic, it can cause challenges, but it's not going to carry out impressive operations. Uh, and the subsequent mobilization that they're carrying out, the annual recruiting drive, uh, is going not going to change the situation either. So I think he's in a very, very desperate situation. The sooner he finally acknowledges that and understands that this is not sustainable in the way that Afghanistan was not sustainable for the Soviet Union, and frankly, the way that Vietnam was not sustainable for the United States. And when you reach that conclusion, you then have to figure out how do we extricate ourselves from something that we can no longer sustain. Uh, The sooner he reaches that conclusion, and then perhaps you could see some possibility for some kind of negotiations, noting that, of course, he does need, over time, to get out from under the personal financial and economic sanctions and export controls. He's got to stop the losses that uh, Russian forces are uh, sustaining. Um, And again, maybe there's some negotiation to be had, noting that the one capability Russia has had that has been significant has been the ability to punish Ukraine, essentially going after civilian, not military, civilian infrastructure, particularly energy, water, and the like, with missiles and and drone swarms that have been bought from Iran. General, I've been talking to people who know uh, President Putin very well, and they tell me that they are absolutely confident that Putin will not recognize defeat, that he will not give in. And so, in a way, why should he recognize uh, uh, what you're uh, calling on him to recognize, which is, from your point of view, the facts that you're not going to be a winner. Uh, but because if what's in it for him to just succumb right now to the circumstances, it means writing off his future. Why would he do that? Uh, because the result could be a humiliating defeat uh, for his country, uh, the country which he is leading and which he has led into this horrible circumstance in which they've already lost the Battle of Kiev, they've lost the battles of Sumy and Chernihiv, two other northern cities uh, in Ukraine, they've lost the Battle of Kharkiv, they've lost all of Kharkiv Oblast, and they're basically losing that territory that they seized since the invasion of 24 February. Maybe there's some negotiating room to be had, maybe there's some way, uh, particularly if the U.S. is to then, uh, on the Ukrainian side, and of course the U.S. has been rightly Uh, noting that nothing about Ukraine without Ukraine. So there's no negotiation without the elected government there, unlike actually, frankly, what we did in Afghanistan. Um, And the U.S., the EU, U.K., together with some other Western countries, perhaps identifying a Marshall Plan reconstruction uh, initiative for Ukraine. And I believe there would have to be some kind of durable security guarantee that's really uh, solid, uh, that could enable Ukraine with confidence, uh, again, to do some negotiation. But again, I think that that is many months away because, as you note, I think you do rightly note that right now Putin is in denial. He still thinks, as I said at the outset, that he can outsuffer uh, the Ukrainians and the Europeans. I don't think he's certainly going to outsuffer the U.S., even regardless of the outcome of this midterm election. 
I think there will still be bipartisan support of Ukraine on Capitol Hill and certainly in the White House. So you think it's a, a, a bipartisan method? It doesn't matter. Who's going to be in control? I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't predict domestic politics and I don't comment on domestic no, politics. I'm, I'm Other saying than how they affect foreign policy. And I believe knowing the individuals on Capitol Hill and individuals who have spoken to me even about their desire to see an appropriation for Ukraine during the lame duck session. Um, that's the kind of support that is there. And again, regardless of the outcome, I think you will see continued bipartisan support for Ukraine on Capitol Hill. Uh, and that uh, certainly will find a willing partner in the White House, uh, which I think has led this particular effort uh, very impressively. Mm. Uh, just one last question before we move uh, into the Middle East. Uh, I think the Pentagon or, or, the, uh, the, the, uh, or the Secretary of Defense said something to the effect that basically Russia is really like a, a, a headache and it's going to be over soon, that the real challenge is China. Do you think Russia is going to be um, sort of like, uh, you know, it's, it's, not, it's, it's, not, it's not part of the calculus of strategic challenge for the United States? Is it over for Russia? With respect, I'm not sure that you've characterized uh, the assessment in the national defense strategy precisely. Uh, they do note, without question, that the so-called pacing threat, the challenge, the what Jake Sullivan again has identified as the severe competition characterizing the relationship with China, that has to be, and rightly is, the focus. It's about the Indo-Pacific. But Russia has been very problematic, obviously. There's a resurgence of uh, Russia's uh, troublemaking. It has backfired badly on Russia in setting out to make Russia great again. Putin has actually made uh, NATO great again. The unity of NATO hasn't been this solid since the end of the Cold War. And two historically neutral countries with very significant capabilities, by the way, Finland and Sweden, are, are now on the threshold of joining NATO as soon as Hungary and Turkey uh, cast their votes in favor, which I think will happen, but it will take some additional diplomatic efforts. I want to move to the Middle East, where you spent uh, seven out of your 10 years in uniform uh, in, in the greater Middle East area. And, and my uh, last 10 years in uniform. Um, uh, tell me something uh, general. Do you think Iran is, is, is playing uh, the wrong card by helping Russia in its war uh, on Ukraine? I mean, I how big think, of a price they would take? Um, Say it I, again? I think it's a big mistake for Iran to throw in with Russia. Uh, it's a losing side. Uh, it's a losing proposition. Uh, it's not going to pay off for them in the long run. And it obviously flouts UN Security Council resolutions uh, that were part uh, of the uh, nuclear agreement. Uh, the And that prohibits the kind of activity that they're carrying out, which is the transfer of missiles and drones to Russia. Uh, my hope, frankly, would be that there will be maritime interdiction uh, of these activities, that there will be further sanctions uh, on Iran for doing this, noting that, of course, these weapons are being used to take out civilian infrastructure, not military infrastructure. These are literally violations of the law of land warfare. Do you think the administration would look into further sanctions against Iran and, and to do that the, the maritime intersection? Um, inter uh, intersecting of, of, of the, what they're shipping to the Ukraine war. Is it still interested in that deal? Is the administration still worried about striking the deal with Iran over the JCPOA and the nuclear, uh, uh, the nuclear, uh, I suppose, deal it's called? Uh, is it, are they going to think, to, to think of more sanctions uh, in order to stop them from uh, getting further involved in the Ukraine war? I, I'm sure that the discussion is ongoing about further sanctions and, of course, with allies and so forth, and to see whether or not you could get them through the UN Security Council uh, as well if they decide to pursue that particular route, uh, although obviously the U.S. can initiate them ourselves together with allies. There's various oh. courses of action that can be pursued there. And again, I'm sure they're discussing the prospects, the possibilities, and the wisdom of maritime interdiction uh, as well. Um, whether I, it's hard for me to predict whether they will decide to go with those at this point in time. Uh, it certainly doesn't appear that the, the resurrection of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Agreement, the nuclear deal, uh, is coming soon to a theater near us. Uh, it certainly won't resurface uh, in, in the week or so before the elections, and I have real doubts about whether it's viable uh, in the longer run, which means... So that, 
is it is the JCPO is it dead or is it in a coma? The JCPOA. Um, well, it, it would probably require resuscitation uh, to use a medical uh, analogy or metaphor. Okay. Uh, about the latest news today, I think it was published by the Wall Street Journal uh, regarding the United States uh, and uh, and Saudi Arabia being very worried about what has been called. Uh, they, they, in fact, they, they, the Wall Street Journal says that they are on high alert after warnings of imminent Iranian attacks. Uh, against, of course, Saudi Arabia, and that the NSC, the National Security Council, uh, is uh, saying that the U.S. is prepared to respond. Can you explain what you think the response will be and how dangerous and how, how true it may be that these are imminent Iranian attacks? What do you know, General? Well, I can't get into any specifics without knowing what actually might take place, and then I'm not going to go down the road of endless hypotheticals frankly, but no, clearly there is deep concern based on a reportedly uh, credible intelligence uh, reports um, in Saudi. And by the way, this is a good example of, of why the U.S. and all Gulf states, not just Saudi Arabia, uh, need to have very strong relations, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, security operations. You know that I was long as the commander of U.S. Central Command uh, and in, in later government positions and so forth, uh, a proponent uh, for an integrated uh, air and ballistic missile defense system throughout the entire Gulf states, something that still has proven uh, elusive. Uh, but that should be uh, something that still should be sought. I suspect uh, that the U.S. Central Command commander still has that as, uh, you know, on his to-do list because it would be very, very advisable. And now you would obviously have to add in much increased uh, shorter range uh, counter drone capabilities, uh, a number of which are being are under urgent development uh, in the United States, in Israel and other locations uh, as well. Uh, but no, these are clearly credible concerns. Uh, Iran is facing very significant uh, domestic turmoil. Uh, they appear to have made a policy decision to begin literally killing uh, demonstrators on the streets. Uh, whether that will quell these demonstrations or not, I think is very much in question. The early indications are that it is inflaming the mobs. You know, the paradox of the situation in Iran uh, is that its strength of the demonstrations is also a, a, a category a, an element of it is that its strength is also its weakness, uh, in the sense that there's really no leadership. It is literally spontaneous. It's almost the equivalent of flash mobs. Uh, they're figuring out how to communicate with each other despite all of the actions by the government to limit that capability. But the problem with that is that, of course, it's also a weakness because there is no true leadership. There's no uh, true, if you will, ideology or other than just the universal rejection of the Iranian regime. So but until, of course, you see regime forces refuse to shoot at their own people, refuse to show up at work in the uh, oil fields, refuse again to take direction by the regime, until you start to see that, in other words, to see the regime begin to uh, show cracks and perhaps crumble, until that transpires, uh, I fear that you're not going to see any kind of uh, transformation of the government in Iran. Do you think the United States uh, is extending support for uh, the protesters, but not for the regime change that they're after? I, I'd leave that up to the U.S. government. I don't want to try to interpret uh, that particular uh, situation, frankly. Um, you know, there's always been a serious question, I think, about whether regime change is truly um, something to which we could aspire in the near term. Uh, one hopes that over time, at some point, that this uh, very extreme regime, which rejects the right of Israel to exist, it rejects the United States, um, uh, and it demonizes, of course, us, it demonizes uh, its uh, Arab uh, neighbors and so forth, and seeks to achieve hegemony over the Shia crescent stretching from Iran through Iraq, Syria, and down into uh, southern Lebanon and Hezbollah, and is trying right now, and something I'm quite worried about, frankly, uh, is Iran's continued effort to Lebanonize Iraq. In other words, to 
achieve the kind of street muscle represented by Hezbollah uh, in Lebanon, and they have the popular mobilization units, a number of which are supported uh, by Iran, Qatab, Hezbollah, Saab al Haq, and some others, uh, and then also to achieve the kind of power in the parliament that at least gives them a veto proof uh, a coalition. Uh, and I'm quite concerned about that. In fact, the latest reports uh, from Iraq where uh, the prime minister, who was very inclusive in his earlier messages and somewhat encouraging, uh, in the last 24 or 36 hours has fired the head of the Iraqi intelligence service, the Joint Operations Command, um, uh, and his media office and a handful of others. And the re reported re replacements are distinctly not encouraging. Uh, the intel service is very heavily associated with the Iranian-supported uh, uh, militias, essentially. Uh, the Joint Operation Command replacement was an inner circle of Abu Mahdi Mohandas, who, of course, was uh, killed in the drone strike that took out Qasem Soleimani, the longtime, over two-decade uh, commander of the uh, Revolutionary Guards Corps Quds Force, and the media office uh, is a co-founder of Qatab Hezbollah. Uh, so, uh, again, if this is the direction in which the new Iraqi government is headed, um, that is very concerning. That's a very recent development. It's probably unfair to be uh, to to assess that this quickly. I hope that this proves to be a, be a premature uh, assessment, uh, but the 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 immediate uh, assessment of this uh, is that this is uh, distinctly negative uh, from my point of view uh, for the cause of Iraq uh, and uh, the reconciliation that is so necessary between uh, Shia, Sunni, Kurds, Turkmen, Yazidis, Christians, uh, Shabak, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, a country that is literally uh, through which the fault lines of ethnic, sectarian, uh, tribal, and other uh, elements run. Uh, General, I want to stay with Iraq, I, although I want to go back to uh, ask you, how is the U.S. prepared to respond in terms of the U.S.? Uh, let me get that out of the way, because I want to get into more Iraqi questions. But how would the U.S. be prepared to respond uh, for in, in, yeah, back to the Saudi uh, situation and the imminent threats by Iran? What is it that one should think of when one hears and reads the U.S. Uh, that the National Security Council is thinking of how the U.S. would respond? Give us a walk through that. Should we use our well, imagination? Well, I hate to fall back on the typical response of an economics professor who always starts out by saying it depends, but it does depend. You know, what is the action? How significant is it? Um, is there significant damage, destruction, casualties? Again, without any kind of specificity, it's impossible to say anything other than to note that there is here again, just as I described as the, there would be uh, in the case of certain Russian actions, there is a menu of options that undoubtedly the uh, National Security Council staff has already been working on. I mean, that's their job together with all of the different uh, departments of the U.S. government uh, to identify what diplomatic, economic, financial, um, and other actions could be taken, as well as what is the menu of options when it comes to actions by the U.S. military. And also, there are always possibilities uh, with uh, what is identified as covert action, as well, the province of the CIA. Security, the security relationship between the United States and Saudi Arabia after the recent uh, um, crisis, spasm, whatever you want to call it, how would you describe that security relationship? Is it solid? Yeah. Look, I think that, um, again, the relationships really between a number of countries in the U.S., when it comes to military and, and intelligence, I wouldn't say that they transcend the particular relationship at the political level at a given time. Obviously, they are carried out in the context of that particular relationship. But they tend to be longstanding. Uh, they tend to be enduring. It's the same with Israel, which has gone through a variety of governments. There's been friction with uh, U.S. governments over time. Um, when I was the commander of U.S. Central Command, although noting that Israel was not part of U.S. CENTCOM, but we had very close relationships because of 
uh, very serious concerns of about a joint threat, uh, i.e. Iran, and uh, in some cases some actions that were being taken together uh, to address that as well as intelligence sharing. And then, of course, when I was at the CIA as well, and again, there were ups and downs in the political relationship uh, between the leaders of the United States. We had two of them during that period alone, and then the uh, prime minister and various ministers uh, in Israel. And obviously, we've had a period of, of uh, friction, uh, and so forth with uh, Saudi Arabia. But again, the security and intelligence relationships, uh, again, tend to continue to function. In some cases, they can be limited, they can be constrained, they operate, obviously, in this political context. Uh, but they are quite enduring. Uh, and I think that's really been the history of the relationship, uh, again, with all of the Gulf states. Uh, with the kingdom, with uh, the Emiratis, uh, and e indeed even with the Israelis, noting that now, of course, you have this very significant development as a result of the Abraham Accords, where uh, there are vastly strengthened relations uh, between some of the Gulf states and Israel, and even those that are not part of the Abraham Accords, at least one of those is actually uh, has a relationship that is somewhat surprising as well. Uh, I have 10 minutes and I need you to kindly help me out because I have like 10 questions left uh, about this situation with Israel being now um, sort of an, an, part of the calculus if you speak about the Gulf security and the crash and the potential clash or deterrence uh, with Iran. Uh, how, how worrisome uh, is it that uh, to think that Iran would take advantage of the Israeli presence in the Gulf and really punish the Gulf states as a result? Will the U.S. be able to come to the rescue? It, it, it is able to. Of course, obviously, that requires a political decision, a policy uh, objective, and so forth. But yes, again, that's the job of the U.S. military and of other uh, departments of the U.S. government and some of our intelligence agencies is to respond if there is a political decision to do that. I don't think, by the way, though, that the proximate cause would be any Israeli activity uh, in the Gulf states. I think the proximate cause would probably be the domestic turmoil in which Iran finds itself, uh, and perhaps some effort to uh, try to uh, stoke nationalism uh, at a time when everything else they have tried to quell the demonstrations, the massive demonstrations uh, on streets of cities throughout Iran has failed. Uh, General, this could sound to you like the conspiracy theory coming from the Middle East, but let me put it to you. Back to Iraq, and let me bring in Lebanon in this equation. So, uh, as you know very well, right now in Iraq, we have the Prime Minister, Mr. Sudani, who is um, very close, let's say, to the former Prime Minister, Nouri al-Maliki, who on his own was is an is really very close to Iran. And we have a president who is not like, you know, Barham Saleh, our common friend, and who is very much pro-Iranian, the government altogether. And the theory here that we hear is that it all came about by U.S. blessing, that the United States had allowed and wanted this to happen in order to sort of maybe to tell Iran, yes, we get it, Iraq is yours. What do you say about this? And then I want to move to Lebanon on the same equation of where does Iran come in and why did it per permit uh, the demarcation? But that's the second question. Please, on Iraq. Did the U.S. Well, I, I, am, I was not privy to the inner workings of government formation, needless to say. Uh, but my sense uh, is that the appropriate response to your question would be a single word, nonsense. Uh, there's no way that would be in... Uh, the U.S. interest, nor do we believe it would be in the interest of the Iraqi people. The Shabal Iraqi don't want uh, a highly sectarian government. You know, Iraqi leaders always, including, by the way, Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki, when I was privileged to command uh, the surge, and he was our partner for that surge, um, he used to say, look, General, we always have to have a relationship with Iran. They're our bigger neighbor to the east. Uh, we have a lot of trade and commerce, and of course, religious tourism is a major industry there as well. Uh, we have to get along with them, but rest assured, we do not want to be the 51st state of Iran. And I think that was the operative big idea 
for many, many years, including all the way through all the recent prime ministers. I would contend even perhaps uh, during uh, Prime Minister Maliki's uh, second term, although it's perhaps you could argue that it eroded during that time because of a variety of in, in, in the sectarian initiatives that he pursued, tragically, uh, right. which I did so much of, of the surge. But again, I just don't think that, that what you laid out as a, this kind of conspiracy theory, I mean, I'm sure that it's appealing to some quarters in the in that region, but I think it's completely nonsensical. You, you are aware that many in this region have a different assessment than yours of uh, Mr. Nouri Maliki and his, uh, you know, his... Uh, I, I'm, no, I'm no fan. This is the man who, right after U.S. forces, combat forces left, undid what we did uh, by pursuing charges against uh, then-President Tariq al-Hashimi, the senior Sunni, then after the finance minister, Rafi al Sawi, and then after a prominent uh, 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 parliamentarian uh, from... Uh, Anbar province. And of course, that all then took the eye off uh, Al-Qaeda in Iraq by that time, the Islamic State, etc. Yeah. So again, I am keenly aware uh, of all of that uh, and certainly hold that prime minister accountable uh, for that. It did not have to end that way. And that was absolutely yeah. tragic. During the period that I was privileged to be the commander there and at U.S. Central Command, uh, actually, there was a good professional uh, partnership uh, that did indeed drive violence down by 85% and kept it down for the subsequent three and a half years. Yeah. I've got five minutes. I've got to jump to Lebanon. So that's maritime demarcation. Uh, it, it, it's uh, supposed to be a big leap, not only between Israel, between Lebanon and Israel, but also in terms of Iran allowing it to happen, Hezbollah being de facto part of it. Uh, is this a fragile arrangement now that it, now that uh, Mr. Netanyahu has been elected uh, Prime Minister of Israel? And he had said during the campaign that he would tear apart this agreement. Well, we'll have to see. Uh, again, as with every agreement in the Middle East, there are pros and cons. Uh, there are certainly arguments uh, against it. There are significant arguments for it, uh, that Israel can get on with uh, exploiting certain reserves that are now clearly on its side uh, of the line, and potentially Lebanon, a country to you, of course, your, your country, uh, that is in such desperate, uh, I mean, it's beyond dire, it's catastrophic. It is a, it is a country whose economy has collapsed, uh, and that is truly on life support. Uh, and needs resuscitation. And I'm at a loss as to what else could possibly uh, bring it back to life uh, other than this kind of initiative, if they could actually make it work. What and about, if, what if about it would Mr. Characterized by corruption and malfeasance and ineptitude, the way so much of what else has happened there over recent years uh, has transpired? The question is precisely about, uh, do you think Mr. Netanyahu will take, well, if Mr. Right, Netanyahu, that's a question for Mr. If Mr. Netanyahu, if Mr. If, if Mr. Netanyahu tells this up, uh, that's Netanyahu. a question for him. I'll, I'll leave that to the, to yeah. the, the government yet, Raghi, Raghi, yeah. let yeah. him form a government, then let's see right. what okay. direction so, he goes, so, see so who so his coalition me. partners are, uh, that will have some bearing on this as well. You know, I look, we should all remember that occasionally, some of what is said during campaigns, uh, uh, it doesn't always uh, end up uh, into policy. Again, there are various constraints or various issues uh, and so forth that it's, it's much easier to campaign sometimes. Gotcha. How about the U.S.? Uh, no, actually, let me ask you another question. How about the Israeli-Iranian relationship uh, as it manifests itself in Syria, for example, uh, where we see Israeli attacks and, and when, where we see that the Russians have told the Iranians, well, you know what, I'm busy with the Ukraine, you take over for now. I have very little time, two minutes. Give me some time on Syria, and I think we will probably have to conclude with that. But, uh, yeah, you are, you, is the United States there to stay? Is it going to be a condominium of coexisting uh, uh, Turkish, uh, American, Iranian, uh, Israeli uh, sort of attacks? What's happening in Syria? Well, what needs to happen in Syria is that the U.S. needs to stay committed. Uh, we have to stay on the ground. Again, it's not a substantial commitment. It is very sustainable. Um, casualties are minimal. 
uh, at most. We have quite good partners in the Syrian Democratic Forces, and we need to stick with them. We need to enable them to build their institutions as one sorts out what will happen in Damascus, what are the possibilities, uh, given all the various stakeholders, uh, including, as you noted, uh, Turkey uh, as well. Uh, for Iran, I think this is uh, a, a losing bet in certain respects. Their efforts to establish infrastructure there are going to be destroyed uh, at every uh, instance. And Israel has done a truly admirable and very impressive job uh, in identifying and then taking out what Iran has attempted to establish there, just as they have done in the past. Uh, for example, when they took out the nuclear program that was established there as well uh, about, I guess, 15 or more years ago now. Iran will remain a menace, uh, a scary threat for the Gulf and the Middle East for a long time, do you think? Or is, is it going to be preoccupied with its internal issues that it may calm down? I guess I'm saying, will they escalate uh, given the, the domestic situation or will, they, will their hands be tied? Well, again, I have to fall back on it depends. And I have to then assume, make a couple of assumptions about what transpires domestically, what transpires uh, in the broader Middle East, um, whether or not they take some action that precipitates action against them, uh, were they to be foolhardy and truly pursue a nuclear device, for example. I again, um, it's impossible in the 30 remaining seconds to uh, give any kind of complete answer to that one, I'm afraid, Ragina. But always a pleasure uh, to be with you. It is always my pleasure, General, and I just thank want you. to thank you for agreeing to do this every year for the uh, for this wonderful event. I, I want to tell Your you, I am in Bahrain, in Bahrain for a wonderful event, which is, of course, the Bahraini Dialogue Forum. And I'm so very blessed to be here because the Pope, as you know, is arriving tonight, I guess, here. And uh, with uh, the, his Sheikh Al-Azhar, there will be meeting, there will be uh, a wonderful spiritual feeling as well coming from this wonderful place receiving the Pope for the first time so bless you all and uh, thank you so much for uh, doing this general and thank you Jean and for uh, and, you know for this tradition it's a lovely tradition yeah, and uh, I'm honored I'm humbled. thank you very much thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Patrice, again we're honored thank you